I think I think we can start. I think we have uh, quite a few connections uh, from the field, uh, and we have a full audience today. Uh, so, Michel, I will. Yeah, hand thank you. To thank you very much. I was thinking uh, Louise or uh, Jan will be sitting near uh, to us, but I welcome you uh, all, uh, particularly the country offices who are connected. I think I don't know how many offices are connected, and uh, also regional offices. But uh, it is an honor and privilege for me uh, to introduce uh, certainly one of the most uh, clever uh, researcher of the world today. I think um, uh, Sharon Lewin, when I met her um, two years back, uh, she was talking about a functional care. She was trying to explain to me all those uh, uh, innovation we need to do to be able to really start thinking about ending AIDS. I think it was inspirational for me. Um, and uh, you heard me in many places talking about uh, my visit in uh, um, Melbourne and uh, Burnett Institute. Uh, I think uh, last week I spent all my time uh, in Rwanda with the president of uh, Rwanda in Burundi uh, talking about um, why it's important for us uh, to uh, democratize the solution of the problem, to be able to make sure that community can uh, uh, on their own response and try to also um, make uh, this dream uh, Sharon had those days a reality. And I can tell you when I heard about the, the Mississippi uh, boy, I was uh, thinking about you. And uh, I just said that uh, I am always inspired by two types of people. It's, uh, it's amazing. It's people generally uh, who are uh, qualified as crazy. I, I always realize those people have been guiding all uh, my uh, thinking, helping me to think uh, out of the box, and the people uh, who are generally qualified as dreamers. So uh, I, I, I can say that uh, uh, the day you will receive um, a Nobel Prize, I will be very happy uh, to say that I had the chance uh, to uh, meet uh, uh, this uh, lady when she was uh, identified as a dreamer. And uh, today, uh, she is uh, the one who is leading us to those transformation which will help us to just end the epidemic. Ending the epidemic should be our game. We should really change our jargon. We should really start uh, thinking uh, about uh, the day we will celebrate that. I don't know when it will happen, but I'm convinced that just uh, uh, saying that is enough to manage the disease, I'm, I'm not part of that. And uh, probably I'm a wrong scientist, I'm not even, so that's why probably, uh, but I'm convinced that one day uh, we'll say that we end this epidemic, uh, we are controlling him. Uh, the epidemic. We don't have any more the epidemic. I don't say that uh, uh, disease will not exist, but at least as an epidemic, it will not exist. So I want uh, to give the floor to uh, Sharon uh, to really uh, convince you, like she has been able to do uh, with all of us in Vienna, and also particularly when I was uh, uh, visiting uh, um, Melbourne and uh, inst uh, uh, Institute uh, uh, where she was uh, working, and uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much uh, for coming and joining us. And I, I, I want to tell you also, uh, she made my life very difficult in uh, Vienna because she is an excellent, excellent uh, 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 presenter. When she was uh, speaking, and uh, I had her to speak uh, uh, before or after, I, I was very, I said, oh, it's finished. No one will talk about <laughs> Michelle today. It will be only Sharon. And it was the case. Sharon, thank you very much for being with us. And thanks to Louise and uh, Riley too, and also our uh, friends um, from Australia. You can see uh, also all the groups uh, who, who came here uh, for uh, the important meeting. And I want to uh, thank also um, Maria Angela for LGBT and uh, uh, Richard Buzensky. I think uh, it's just about leadership. Thanks.
Thank you, Michelle. Um, wonderful introduction. I'm very glad you s classified me as a dreamer and not crazy. I thought the uh, introduction was going, she's crazy. She thinks Plus it's going to be a cure. Um, it's really a great honour to be here at UNAIDS. This is my first time in Geneva. Um, UNAIDS is uh, an amazing institution with, um, that's done an incredible amount of good work and um, really a dream for me to be addressing you here today. So, um, Michelle already talked about uh, where we met. It was um, Vienna in, in 2010 and I realised that Michelle was in his job for just, I think, 18 months when he spoke. And um, the conference organisers were were pretty game, I think, because they decided to have a scientific presentation at the opening session the first time that I think IAS had done that, and I was asked um, to talk about cure. And I met Michelle afterwards, and two things um, remain very, I remember very well. The first was that the whole concept was totally new to Michelle, the head of UNAIDS, the concept of people working towards a cure was, was a totally new concept. It was really energised by that idea and it made me realise how we need to really get the message out there yeah. and um, really make this a reality that everyone's going to be talking about, you know, finding a cure and putting that as a scientific priority. But um, more importantly, what I remember is that Michelle said to me that I reminded him of his daughter. And of course, <laughs> I'm no way young enough to be his daughter. So that, of course, um, sat with me for a long time. Little did I realise that he charms everyone and says things like that. But he said that my, my energy, his daughter, his daughter was a scientist and I reminded him of his daughter. So I hope I still do remind you of um, your daughter, Michelle, a few years later. At the end of my talk, um, I ended by saying that um, the conference in Vienna would not be a time where we could announce a cure, but I hoped that it would be the beginning of where we would prioritise cure as a major scientific priority and ended by saying that we should be thinking about HIV prevention, treatment, care and cure. And now when I look back, when I was asked to give this talk, I look back really over what's happened over the last three years and I, I do really think that Vienna marked the beginning of um, many people taking this challenge um, very seriously. Uh, there has been quite a significant uh, progression in the science, there has been a significant progression in advocacy and funding and um, I think it's uh, wonderful that I've been asked to now talk to you about uh, what's happened over the last few years and then, and then mention um, that the conference, as many of you know, the International AIDS Conference will be in Melbourne in, in 2014 and what we might be working towards in 2014. So I'm going to start by um, convincing you why we, why we need a cure for HIV and I, and I hope I don't need to convince um, this audience but the reasons why we need a cure are, are fairly compelling and I think um, have, are still the same now as they were in 2010. The first is we have fantastic treatment for HIV, unbelievable success story, antiretrovirals, but life expectancy still remains reduced in many people, particularly those who start antiretroviral therapy late with a CD4 count less than 200. And we know there's ongoing morbidity on ART. So um, life has improved dramatically, but there's still issues around inflammation, um, chronic aging and ongoing morbidity. I think all of you know the statistic that for every two new patients who initiate ART, there are five new infections. So to cope with the numbers of people we will need to treat um, is, is very significant. And I don't um, mean to um, diminish the work at all of many in the room in their, um, their advocacy to find funding, but really funding lifelong ART for all who need it lifelong um, is is going to be a really, really tough ask. So I think we can work in partnership because if we find a cure, a way of shortening the duration that someone needs to be on ART, we can eventually treat a lot more people and I think will um, we'll really help this strategy of universal access. So I'm going to um, quickly talk about whether HIV cure is possible and there's been some great stories around this just in the last um, three years. Um, briefly, what the major barriers to cure are, knowing that most of you are not um, scientists, but just so you understand the principles of why this has been so difficult. 
talk about what strategies are being tested, another area of great change in the last few years, and finally what I think are some of the um, current and future challenges. So first of all, is um, HIV cure possible? Well, we, I think we now know the answer to that, and the answer is 100% is yes. What do, we, what do we first of all mean by cure? And I think this, could be a, this can be a little confusing for people. Traditionally, if you think of an infectious disease, cure means elimination of the infection altogether. So in, in someone with HIV, it would mean eliminating all HIV-infected HIV cells. We could find no HIV RNA or less than one copy per mil. And this is now commonly referred to as a sterilising cure, which I think could be a little confusing for people, but it's a conventional cure, eradicating HIV totally. What might be more realistic is to put HIV into remission, or think of it as how we think about cancer. So someone would have long-term health in the absence of ART. Their viral load would still be detectable, but would be less than 50 copies per mil, where we know most people stay well. And this is what we mean by a functional cure. And I think over the last few years, we've begun to think that a functional cure is probably going to be more achievable but most of the research is working towards both, finding a functional cure or a sterilising cure. So the first example of the sterilising cure was um, Timothy Brown, or the Berlin patient, whom I'm sure many of you heard about. His, the, his, the report of his case was announced in 2009. In 2014, he remains completely cured of HIV, no HIV detectable anywhere in his blood, in his tissue. He has a sterilising cure. And as many of you know, he had achieved a sterilising cure through a very um, intensive, aggressive regimen which required a bone marrow transplant because he had leukaemia. And he received a transplant from a person who was naturally resistant to HIV. The person carried a mutation in one of the receptors that HIV uses called CCR5. So an un unusual case, his physician in Berlin at the time was a highly creative scientist who, th who really did plan to do this by finding this unique donor, but no one has been able to replicate this yet, largely because finding a suitable donor who is appropriate to transplant and also lacks the mutation is incredibly difficult. No, it's not that it has been tried and it failed, it's just that we haven't been able to find the right donor for the right person. But here's an inspirational case because it tells us sterilising cure is possible. And then as Michelle mentioned just several months ago um, in Atlanta, there was the announcement of the Mississippi baby, um, a so-called functional cure, a, a um, case described by Deborah Passaud of a young um, um, infant, a pregnant mother who, a, who, a young infant who received treatment within 36 hours of birth, so very early treatment, then had treatment stopped um, at the age of 18 months and has had no rebound in virus over a two-year period. So an, uh, an example of functional cure, you can, they, they can still find very low traces of HIV in the Mississippi baby, but the virus has not rebounded to levels that you would expect. Now we don't know why the Mississippi baby was cured. Most people think it's because it was very early treatment that it managed to prevent the virus getting into what I will explain later as these long-term reservoirs. And then just following on for that, uh, some, a really interesting group of patients, the Visconti patients, also examples of functional cure. These were 14 patients in France who started treatment very early after infection and after two to three years stopped their treatment and had no rebound in virus. So had, again, another example of functional cure in 14 patients. And the estimates, at least from the French hospital database, is that up to 10% of patients who start ART in acute infection, so as soon as they're um, within weeks of being infected, are able to naturally control their virus. Now, um, this again doesn't give us a cure because treating people very early in infection is really an impossible task. But it tells us that if we can limit the amount of virus that gets into these reservoirs, that might be enough to allow the patient to take long-term control. And then finally, um, two further patients, the Boston patients, 
who um, received a transplant because they both had um, lymphoma, so they needed a transplant for the treatment of their cancer. But in this, and in this case, they got uh, irradiation, which is standard treatment before a transplant. But in this case, they got a bone marrow transplant, not from a donor that was naturally resistant to HIV, and a, a what's called a wild-type donor. And then in the follow-up, the doctors have been unable to detect HIV, either DNA or RNA, in these two patients. Now, these patients haven't yet stopped treatment, but it suggests that maybe just transplantation alone leads to eliminating the reservoir. We may not need a fancy donor that's naturally resistant to HIV. So just in the last few years, we've had now several cases, the Berlin patient, the Mississippi patient, the Visconti patients, and now the Boston patients, all telling us that in these unusual situations, long-term persistence of HIV didn't occur. And we need to really dissect and understand this, but it gives us great hope that a cure is possible, and we're hoping we'll hear more of these sporadic cases over the years to come. So um, having started with the um, success stories, I'm now going to explain what the major barriers to cure are and why current treatment doesn't cure HIV. So all of you know, when you put people on treatment, viral, viral load rapidly declines to usually less than 50 copies per mil. Patient CD4 T cells recover. But in pretty much all patients, except the, these Visconti patients, when you stop treatment, within about three weeks, the virus quickly comes back. We've now got much more sensitive ways of picking up virus in people on treatment. And if you measure something called HIV DNA, which is basically HIV inside an infected cell. You can detect HIV DNA in all patients on treatment. And if you use a much more sensitive assay that detects down to one copy per mil as opposed to 50, you can detect low levels of RNA, which means the virus itself in blood in most patients at around three to five copies per mil. So, of course, the, the most important question is where is this RNA, low-level virus, DNA, infected cells coming from? And it's thought it's coming from three major sources. The first is um, what we call latency or latently infected T cells, and I'll explain what I mean by that because that's the biggest problem. Residual viral replication and anatomical reservoirs. So what do I mean by latency? Well, HIV has this trick of being able to get inside a cell, it's demonstrated here, get inside the patient's DNA and effectively go to sleep inside the resting T cell. However, there is infectious virus still there. It's a trick that many viruses similar to HIV use. Um, it's a way of sort of staying out of action but always being able to come back again. And it infects cells and establishes latency in very long-lived cells, cells that are around, um, that are part of your um, immunological memory system, so they're there for the, for the lifespan of the individual. But at any time, virus can be released from the latently infected cell. The cell itself can be activated and release more virus. But in a person that's on treatment, the virus can't go anywhere. It can't go on to infect new cells. So it doesn't cause a problem in people on treatment. The other, and also we know that those um, latently infected cells can divide and undergo what we call homeostatic proliferation. So these, this is really the big, big trick. This is the major barrier to cure, the capacity for HIV to have this sort of um, trick up its sleeve to go into hiding and um, can't be accessed by the drugs. The other um, reason why HIV persists is that in some people you have ongoing rounds of replication, meaning that antiretroviral therapy blocks about 99.9% .9 of virus replication but can't stop the last bits of replication. And we now know in about 30% 30, 30 or about a third of patients on antiretroviral therapy there's low level replication. But getting rid of this replication by adding additional anti-HIV drugs won't cure HIV. It will just stop the persistent rounds of replication. And finally, we know that HIV can sequester itself in anatomical reservoirs, in the brain, in the gut, in the genitourinary tract, in the lymph node, and it infects unique long-lived cells in those sites. And at the moment, I don't think we know how 
important these reservoirs are. Certainly in people like the Berlin patient, these tissue reservoirs did not seem to be important and the most important issue was latency in the blood. So um, having said that, what are some of the, the strategies that um, people are testing? And I think this is an area that's really come a long way since um, I gave that talk in Vienna in 2010. There are now multiple clinical trials looking at strategies to cure. And the, the main approaches people are using are trying to eliminate lately infected cells, make cells resistant to HIV, um, eliminate residual virus replication, which we know won't cure HIV, or enhance the immune response. And the, the two areas that are most advanced are these first two, eliminating lately infected cells or making cells um, resistant to HIV. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the work um, we and others have been doing in that area. So eliminating lately infected cells, this is um, a concept that might be a bit um, counterintuitive. It's effectively waking up that sleeping virus, so therefore the virus then becomes visible um, to the immune system or the virus itself will kill the cell. And that's represented here. So this is a lately infected cell. The virus is inside the DNA, not causing much trouble. The idea is to activate that virus and then the virus starts making viral particles that um, could potentially be recognised by the immune system or kill the cell itself. And we can measure those um, different parts of the virus using different assays, um, looking at uh, HIV proteins or the virus itself. And the idea here is that on the way out, if you activate that lately infected cell, the virus on its, way out, on its way out will kill the cell. So it's a way of, it's counterintuitive because we're actually promoting virus replication, but we think doing it is safe in someone that's on treatment because any virus we push out of the cell can't go on to cause more trouble because the patient's already on antiretroviral therapy. And we actually have lots and lots of different drugs that do this um, in the laboratory. And um, people have been working on this for years. And many of these drugs are already in um, treatment for other diseases. And so the most um, uh, attractive compound to start with was um, drugs that fall into this group. They're called HDAC inhibitors, histone deacetylase inhibitors. They're drugs that are used for the treatment of cancer. And they turn on latent HIV very effectively, and they're already licensed for the treatment of cancer. So the first um, clinical trial of one of these drugs, an HDAC inhibitor, was reported in Nature last year by David Margolis from the University of North Carolina, and he gave a single dose of one of these drugs, the drug's called Varinostat, it's used to treat a rare form of skin cancer, and showed that Varinostat could effectively wake up the virus, but he used a, a sophisticated way to measure virus inside cells. And then uh, we went on to um, just complete a clinical trial of uh, 20 patients, all who've been on treatment for a number of years, well-controlled virus, high CD4 counts, who received 14 days of the drug and asked the question, a, can you wake up the virus? And B, if you wake up the virus, does it kill the cell? And so we've just, re we've just finished this, and uh, we reported the findings in CROI earlier this year. And uh, what we found was um, that if we measured the virus inside the cell, so RNA inside the cell, we showed that um, before you gave the drug, there was a significant increase on the drug, and that stayed significantly elevated once you stopped the drug. So on average, you increase the amount of, you woke up the virus by turning on RNA inside the cell. When we looked at how many infected cells there were measuring DNA this time, so this is the number of lately infected cells, you can see we actually had no change at all. So in 14 days, you, you could see this as a glass half full, a glass half empty, I'm a glass half full kind of person. Um, you, we certainly showed evidence we could wake up the virus. In the 14 days in which we gave treatment, we didn't see loss of infected cells. And um, that may mean that we need more potent drugs to wake up the virus, which we have. It might mean we need to give drugs for longer, which um, is possible, or we might need to give an activating agent and then something that comes in and mops up the recently activated cell. But this is a really big step forward because for many years, most people thought latency was fixed. You couldn't do anything to change it. 
And now there are many studies um, using this strategy underway. So there are studies of other HDAC inhibitors. These drugs are far more potent drugs um, than the first drug we use, Virinostat. These are one study finished now in Denmark and the results to come out soon, another about to start in the US. And then other, other agents, the details of how they work aren't important, all in clinical trials at the moment, testing this idea, can you wake up the virus? And if you wake up the virus, will it kill the cell that um, it came out of? One, one big issue for this approach is that latently infected cells are really rare. They occur on average, they cause a lot of trouble, but they uh, on average are only about one in a million cells. And all of the drugs that we use aren't HIV specific. So they're doing their act, the Varinostat, for example, is acting, is acting on all of the different, all of the HIV negative um, cells as well, which means that there are associated toxicities. And toxicity is a big issue in these clinical trials because patients are actually doing pretty well on treatment. So we have to be very careful to minimise toxicity. And the other um, $50 million question is when we know we can activate this latent virus because we can measure RNA inside the cell. But so far we haven't shown we, that that kills the cell. And so the question is, will we need something else to come in and kill the cell? But I think this area is one of, prom of great promise. I'm really quite um, passionate about this approach because this is potentially scalable if it works because it is oral agents, it's self-limited, it's something we could do um, on, a, on a big scale if we find um, that it works. The other um, approach is to make cells resistant to HIV, um, and this is also an exciting area of science, might be harder to translate into a bigger audience. And this is using um, gene therapy, or literally um, gene scissors that are able to find a particular gene and literally chop it out of a cell. And we already know that we can do this. We can, do, we can use these gene scissors that are now very, very specific, meaning that they make very few mistakes. You can engineer them so they just recognise the gene of interest and don't cause trouble elsewhere. And we have gene scissors that recognise this protein, CCR5, the protein I mentioned at the beginning that, um, that um, is needed for HIV to enter a cell and we can actually use gene scissors or gene therapy to knock out CCR5. And you can also use these gene scissors to knock out HIV itself, and that's already been successfully done in a test tube model. It'll be harder to deliver that into people. But gene therapy studies for um, CCR5 are already underway. There's about eight gene therapy studies um, being done in the US. And this is how it works. Basically, people um, who, who are HIV infected on treatment donate very large amounts of blood. In their blood, they have both CCR5 positive cells, shown here in blue, and CCR5 negative cells naturally, um, naturally occurring. And then in the laboratory, these um, cells undergo this treatment with gene scissors, which knocks out the CCR5. And then um, there's growth of the CCR5 negative cells. So it's a way of changing all your cells from mixed CCR5 positive negative to all CCR5 negative, effectively making them resistant to HIV. And then you reinfuse those cells back in the patient. So this is already being done. Um, the first stu study was reported several years ago. It showed that it was safe and well tolerated, that the CCR5 modified cells persisted. They were present at about six, one to six percent in blood at 24 weeks, and you could also find them in tissue. And um, there now the big challenge is to try and increase this number so it might be 50% of cells are CCR5 negative and there are some really clever ways that um, people are doing this now actually actually taking bone marrow cells removing it knocking out CCR5 and putting back in the bone marrow so very high tech actually most people think that this is going to get us a cure earlier but simplifying this approach to make it um, scalable will be a challenge. Well, I think the science is really important. We thought that antiretroviral therapy was impossible to get into low-income countries. So who knows what this might look like in, in, in 10 years' time. So um, 
We've come a long way um, on the science. I've shown you just a few highlights at helping us understand cure research. I want to convey to you that the field is really progressing in, in, with respect to its clinical trials, but there are certainly some current and future challenges. And um, one of those is, I think, managing unrealistic expectations. So this was a headline um, in April from The Telegraph. Danish breakthrough for HIV cure expected within months. This was the Danish study that had just finished enrolling. They hadn't even got their results yet. Um, the journalists um, misconstrued what the investigators were saying. This, this headline spread through like wildfire. And these headlines really don't do a good service to the field because people are going to become very cynical that, oh yeah, you know, sure, we heard about the cure last month. So we've got to be really, really careful with the messages that we met, that messages we convey. We want to convey the excitement. We want people to invest. We want people to believe this is, this is possible, but not to create unrealistic expectations and worse unrealistic expectations uh, for patients who really think that this is around the corner. And then I think there's a whole lot of other ethical considerations. Um, there, I mentioned before about risks and toxicities. We're, we're dealing with patients that are extremely well and doing well. Most, um, interestingly enough, patients really want to participate in this research. We had no problems in enrolling patients in these studies in Australia. And surveys of HIV-infected patients show that many will participate, even if it's not going to bring a benefit to them alone. But we, have, we can't use agents that are going to have high risks or unacceptable toxicities. We don't yet know how little virus needs to be there before we can stop um, antiretroviral therapy or perform a treatment interruption. So there's a lot of work to be done to make, um, to improve the ways we measure virus that persists in people and antiretroviral treatment. Expectations of study participants are, um, are also an important issue to manage. We don't have a cure. This is really altruistic research and um, we need to work very closely with the community to make sure that that's well understood. And I think um, what we mustn't do is confuse the discussion here. Universal access to ART must remain a top priority. Any cure intervention is going to be done in partnership with ART. And so then it, need, it needs to be thought of as in partnership, not, in, not as in competition. So the IAS um, have had um, a really major role in, in pushing this forward um, in, a, in a very um, strategic way, largely led by Francoise Barros in UC. Um, the, uh, the cure agenda has become one of the major pillars of the IAS um, strategy. And um, I've, this is an initiative um, spearheaded by Francoise, a scientific strategy which we launched in 2012, which outlined the main areas in which um, cure research should be prioritised. But beyond the strategy, there's a lot of work going on in um, advocating for funding, um, ensuring that there's international scientific collaborations, that there's a platform for scientists to know about data early. There's interactions between basic and clinical science. Um, I think crosstalk with other scientific disciplines is key, thinking about... Um, we, we, um, we were talking about this before, we, we run the danger of all thinking the same way and if we interact with other scientific disciplines like how you manage cancer, for example, this could be very informative. And towards this, in fact, there's a think tank next week which Francoise has organised between HIV researchers and non-HIV researchers that's happening in Paris. Um, ethics and cost effectiveness, there are now working groups looking at this. Um, cost effectiveness is really, really important in justifying increased funding towards cure research and the ethics of this research. Industry engagement is key. Um, there's an IS um, uh, industry liaison group to make sure that um, pharma are engaged, investing and um, working towards finding a cure and of course community engagement. So this is all work being driven by the IAS um, to extend and advocate um, for, for this as a, a scientific priority. And I think on the funding level we are, are really winning. Um, all of these organisations now um, you know, have substantial investment in cure research. Um, one of the most impressive, I really do think, is the National Institutes of Health that's, um, that's put up close to $100 million in the last three years 
primarily aimed at cure research. And money isn't going to be um, everything, but money will certainly accelerate um, collaboration, new ideas and move the field forward. So um, in conclusion, we now have multiple examples of cure um, and it's given hope that a cure might be achievable. There's multiple strategies being tested in early proof of concept studies that I've already shown you. Um, I think engage, scientists can't work alone in this. They need to engage the community, regulatory bodies, pharmaceutical companies. And I think we always need to keep in mind we want to push the science forward, but we need to always think we need that ultimately we'll need a strategy that's um, cheap, scalable and widely available. So I'm just going to say a few last words about, um, about Melbourne and the conference. I'm, uh, I'm delighted to be co-chairing the conference in Melbourne in 2014 together with Francoise barras which means that the whole conference will be on HIV cure. No, I'm only joking about that. We're, we're, we're going we're gonna to make sure we um, have a diverse focus, but obviously a very interesting cure. Um, this is Melbourne with um, the spire uh, lit red at World AIDS Day, and we're very excited that um, Michelle will be joining us um, in World AIDS Day this year, uh, which we think will be a fantastic um, uh, lead up uh, to the conference. And I just thought I'd say a few words. Um, the organisation, of course, is being uh, managed beautifully by the International AIDS Society, with Anouk Ray as um, the head of the conference secretariat. And many of the committees have all, uh, all of the committees have now been established. And we have our, our third committee meeting in Paris next week, later in the week, which will be really focused on, on deciding what um, the key themes of the conference are going to be. So these um, next few slides are really my own perspective um, of the conference. Obviously, it's a, it's a team effort, but just a bit about what I think will be our priorities. So first of all, um, Australia is absolutely ecstatic to host the conference. Not that um, Lewis looks too ecstatic, or the minister, or me. We look a little bit washed out there, but that was all I could find. Um, but I think Lewis... <laughs> Jet lagged. Well, I, I don't have any excuse here, but the, I mean, anyway, we, we, we really are. I'm Australia. This is the first time the conference is coming to Australia. It will be the biggest medical conference ever held in Australia, and I think we have managed to excite certainly the state um, government. This is um, Minister Dave, David Davis, who's our health minister, who's been um, an incredible supporter of the conference. And so what we've been doing really is um, getting support from both the Victorian and, and Commonwealth governments. Australia, um, HIV actually has always been had bipartisan support within um, our, uh, our country. So although we're in, we have a mix of governments in, in both state and Commonwealth, we really do have strong bipartisan support. We've got strong engagement from the city of Melbourne. Um, the conference will be in Melbourne in July, which is winter, which is not um, the best time for our city, but the city has a lot of um, great um, pride in its culture and its food, its galleries, um, theatres, etc. And the city of Melbourne are really, really engaged to make it an event beyond the conference. We've had in Australia a great history of partnership between um, community and stakeholders and I think we're already seeing um, that that's going to be replicated in participation in the conference. And we have the, the, uh, the IS Secretariat established with um, Yelena Milovic um, based uh, at the Alfred with me. So we're, we've got very good um, working relationships with IS. So what, is, what are some of the challenges that I see for um, the conference? Well, first of all, we, we have an, a federal election in Australia in September um, of this year. I mentioned that um, we've had strong bipartisan support for HIV. I don't think that's of any concern at the conference, but it does have a certain sense of um, instability in some of the relationships we can forge now. But as of September, we'll know the government. Um, the, co the, co the main focus of the conference, a significant focus of the conference will be regional issues within Asia Pacific and we're working hard to get significant regional engagement. We really want um, Asia Pacific to feel ownership of the conference in the same way Australia does. And this means more than just engaging the, com the scientific communities but also um, significant political engagement and community engagement. 
At the same time, we need meaningful global engagement, um, of course, with um, every other part of the world where um, HIV is an issue. And given Australia's distance, cost, climate, visa requirements, we know we have a number of um, significant areas that we need to work hard and to make sure that none of this is a barrier for people to come into Melbourne. And finally, um, there, you know, we may be, we're going to be in a different space as of the end of 2014, you know, looming targets um, for 2015 and, and um, post-millennium development goals. So these are some of the challenges that we see. What are some of the key issues? And again, this is just a personal um, perspective. The issue of, of course, access to antiretroviral treatment, a historic time in the AIDS epidemic where we need to treat now or pay later and maintain, pay later and to maintain that strong and clear message to funders. Um, I think the conference will be an opportunity to highlight that all is not so good and that there are significant ongoing epidemics or as we were talking about hotspots in marginalised um, high risk groups and that's especially so within the Asia Pacific region and this will be a real opportunity to, for us to look at what we're going to do with um, these particular high risk groups. I think um, justice will be a big um, theme and I've, I've taken this quote from Steve Krauss and I thought it, was, it, was, it summed it up beautifully that there, we still have an epidemic of discriminatory laws, particularly in our region, and that's an area that we need to focus on strongly um, in, in 2014. And of course, um, science. I mean, as a clinician, as a basic scientist, I um, really am passionate about what science has brought us. I mean, we um, have antiretroviral treatment because of great science. We've managed to get it into, um, into people's lives by great partnerships with community and, um, and through advocacy, but the science is where this, these great moves came from and we need to have the same urgency about the science for finding a vaccine and finding a cure if we're ever going to see uh, the end of HIV. So I, I think science, certainly I, I think I can speak on behalf of my co-chair Francoise, will be you know, a very big issue for us, like having the best science and hopefully some really um, big advances by next year. So um, it's 14 months out. Um, we've got lots of work to do. I, I, I hope many of you have seen the logo. And um, although we haven't yet crystallised the themes, for me, the logo um, says it all. The logo was, was, came about through a competition we had amongst youth that was um, at Global. And the winner was um, Johanna Longinus Howell from Dar es Salaam in Tanzania and he's a 21 year old man who works for an NGO in Dar es Salaam. He's never left Tanzania and he'll come to Melbourne for the first time um, to be announced with the um, award of having designed the winning logo and I think the logo is wonderful. It's um, it uh, of course has the AIDS ribbon in the shape of feet um, and it's a it's a logo that is inclusive it means um, that anyone with HIV is not alone. Any solution that we have in uh, moving forward will be done as a community. Um, no one will be left behind. Um, the logo was then adapted by a local Indigenous Australian graphic design form called um, Gilibar and um, put this beautiful burnt orange colour on the logo. And although, um, and really most of Australia is this beautiful burnt orange colour. So as an Australian, it, it really speaks to me. Um, it's optimistic, um, it's forward thinking, it's inclusive. They're all values um, we hold very strong in Australia and they're all values that will be a core part of the conference. And um, although we will finesse the, um, what will be the legacy, these will be the core principles that will guide um, our path towards AIDS 2014. So just finally, um, acknowledging um, many of the people I work with on cure research, um, particularly at the Alfred Hospital Monash University and the Burnett Institute where I work, um, associations um, and collaborations across the world and Stockholm and San Francisco um, and locally within Melbourne, uh, funding from a large um, group of, uh, of agencies. I just want to also acknowledge um, the work so far in, in AIDS 2014. Of course, um, this is all driven by the International AIDS Society, um, work with um, Anouk and Bertrand and their team in the Conference Secretariat. 
the members of the conference coordinating committee, which of course includes um, UNAIDS, our other permanent partners and our local and regional partners, and funding for the conference from the Commonwealth, State Government and uh, City of Melbourne. I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Michelle, you want to start with a few no, questions? I please? think you can facilitate now. I wanted just to say that after this uh, excellent presentation, probably I can uh, go to Melbourne, because if the conference is about cure, I can start uh, talking <laughs> about cure. But um, I want just to uh, thank you again for uh, uh, your vision, your capacity to really inspire all of us. Uh, it's a um, great moment in the fight against uh, HIV AIDS because it's a moment where we are trying to really bring a, again back science, make sure that uh, uh, science will not be just in the corner, but we will foster the link uh, between science and social change. So to really enable us uh, to use uh, a scientific uh, discovery to reach uh, people and uh, to do that one, it's not possible without our partnership uh, with uh, Bertrand. And um, so I want to welcome uh, Bertrand, International Aid Society uh, leaders who is with us. We are trying to strengthen this uh, partnership because we believe that uh, is a missed opportunity. Uh, we all are talking about the same thing, generally in a different corner. And if we can come together and to advocate and strengthen our capacity to reach people with uh, uh, information we have is very important, but that's not the issue. I want just to give you the floor and to ask a question and uh, challenge uh, uh, Sharon on these uh, very important issues, which is about cure. Who will start? Yeah, yes. We'll, we'll, we can start here. Yes, please. Um, hi, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for such a wonderful presentation. Uh, my name is Midnight. I uh, work for the Asia Pacific Coalition on Male Sexual Health, and I've been invited uh, for two days a uh, meeting here um, by UNAIDS, um, talking actually about how do we um, invest more into um, generating demand for treatment amongst the um, key vet population. So I'm here uh, representing um, the gay and the MSM um, populations uh, from the Asia Pacific region. So I think this is really uh, such an opportunity, and thank you for the invite um, for me to attend here, Louis and um, Michelle. I would like to um, add a little bit onto your presentation about the upcoming um, conference in, uh, in Melbourne, because in the Asia Pacific region, we are having an international congress on AIDS in Asia in, uh, at the end of November, but also there is another conference in Kuala Lumpur on um, the pathogenesis. And I think um, the main theme that you've already identified a lot uh, around the discrimination and the laws and policies, especially for, um, I think, countries where the discrimination is it's from the uh, environment that's created by the, the laws in, um, in the countries, so, uh, and also uh, practices of, um, of faith that I think uh, really impact the access to health of um, gay men and transgender people and other MSM in, in our region. And I like the fact that your presentation includes the community uh, within the response and also to ensure that we are at the heart of the response and be at these kind of conferences and uh, at the table to talk to and, have, and having partner, partnerships with each other. My, um, I think my, 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 my call out to uh, to the conference in, in Melbourne is yeah, how do we actually ensure that partnership that we bring the, the voices of the community to the AIDS conference in 2014, building up on the conference in Kuala Lumpur at this meeting that's going to be coming up uh, around um, access to services uh, for MSM and, and gay men. And what's your plan for the uh, ICAP 11 in Bangkok this year? And I think this will be really crucial to ensure that there's that momentum before they build up to, um, to Melbourne. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, <coughs> the conference in Kuala Lumpur this year in July and then ICAP in Bangkok and Melbourne in July 
if you were a glass half empty person, you would say that's a real risk for our conference, glass half full, it's a real opportunity to build momentum and that's exactly how I see it. So we really want to make sure there's a continuing dialogue or there's some, uh, there's some strategies that we can enhance participation to Melbourne through some of the developments in those, in those meetings. And um, I think some of, some of it will be around, um, I, I'm really keen to make sure that we attract lots of young investigators, young scientists, young community members who are going to be, you know, the next generation that are, that are going to be tackling the epidemic. And I'd like, what we're thinking about with, um, with ICAP and with IS is strategies to help people um, prepare abstracts, for example, for the conference to allow them to attend um, scholarship programs to make sure that we can access, that we can enhance attendance. Um, I, think, I think Australia has a really big interest in, um, in outreach to the Asia Pacific region and there will be additional investment from AusAid around assisting people from the region to come. And I think some of the discussions around the themes that, I mean, uh, uh, we're, ju we're just beginning that dialogue, but we, we want to make sure about, about what the key themes will be in Melbourne, but we want to make sure that they build on what's being talked about in Bangkok. So we have some uh, official links with mem members of the organising committee for MICAP. And I think um, even a, we, in, in Washington, we held sort of a, uh, a meeting looking towards AIDS 2014 and, and something along those lines could be done in Bangkok so we can make sure we, we, we continue the momentum of what's being discussed there in, in, in Australia. But it's a tremendous opportunity to really focus on, on what's happening in Asia Pacific uh, with those three conferences all within 12 months. Right. I think, thank, thank yes. you. Yes, uh, I just want to remind people listening uh, from the country offices that you are welcome to also send questions oh, to yes. Sharon through email, gma at unace.org. And I think we already have one, but we'll get to that. In a minute. Thanks very much. It's a really um, insightful and interesting uh, presentation. Um, I've heard it mentioned by others that perhaps it could be that the functional cure that happened in uh, Mississippi may happen more often in utero, but maybe it has not been examined. And I'm wondering what your thoughts on that might be. Maybe more kids do indeed become spontaneously functionally cured before they are born, but we may not know. Yeah, I think um, that's an excellent question. And the Mississippi patient, the Mississippi baby is one patient and a lot of people become very cynical about a report of one but it, it changes the way you think. You begin thinking maybe this is more common than what we've ever thought about and in fact at the um, meeting in Atlanta there was a report of five other babies that had also received early treatment. In follow-up the amount of virus in their blood measuring DNA and RNA was now negative and physicians looking after those babies are now contemplating a treatment interruption which they may never have thought about before. So I think it's really raised awareness that this, exactly as you say, could be more common than we think, but people have never, have never looked. And also the issue of stopping treatment in, in children has always been a very sensitive issue, but we now have a little bit of confidence that it may, um, it may give us the answer. So I think the next step will be the follow-up of those five patients that were already reported and a plan for treatment interruption. And there's also bigger plans of, um, of a more in, you know, intensive um, study to see whether early treatment can lead, lead to change. But the first thing is awareness that this happens and, and, and following patients. And again, um, the National Institutes of Health have um, taken really significant leadership here in funding a whole number of research programs around paediatric cure. So it might be more, we may hear more about it. Thanks. Uh, when you ask questions, please uh, introduce yourself first. Sharon, hi, I'm Peter Godfrey Fawcett, and I think I'm sort of that little tiny blob that might be the third toe, <laughs> um, because I'm the uh, co-chair of the Epidemiology um, Track C oh. committee from, from UNAID, so delighted that we're going to be working more closely with you in the future. Um, and I've also just come back from Washington from the impact meeting where the Mississippi, I, I like to call her the Mississippi miracle because being a baby is a bit much, but I, I see it as a Mississippi miracle. Um, so it's a parlance that we're trying to keep, keep going. 
Um, so I've got two questions for you, really. The, the first is a, is a bit cheeky, since you're, since you're sitting there, is that following on from the Mississippi miracle, one of the things that, that we're doing here in UNAIDS is to organize a high-level meeting to, to think about some of the implications of the Mississippi miracle, um, to think about what that means for pediatric antiretroviral treatment, for elimination of mother-to-child transmission, um, for, as, as Caruso was rightly saying, the sort of the issues of whether, you know, what, what the science means for, for children with, with post-exposure prophylaxis. So, so we're organizing a meeting in Durban next month. The first question is, would you like to come? Sure. Um, and you, can, you don't have to answer straight away, but it's a, it's a serious question. Um, the second question, which is perhaps a, a sort of a, you know, a slide from the, from the Mississippi baby, is to let the babies grow up a little bit and the issue of youth. And I think that, you know, we've seen so much that, that the, the response to HIV dies if we don't continually keep youth engaged with, with the issues and the challenges. Um, we know that youth will find it difficult to come to your conference. Um, we know that youth are largely involved, not in sitting around in meetings like this, but rather in their, you know, in their social media and other outlets. And so I want to really think about how in the conference we manage to make the conference reach out to you through social media and networking to really make them feel a part of it and feel that they have something to contribute and, and can get the benefit from it. So the question is what, you know, how are you going to make youth central to Melbourne 2014? Yeah, I think that's um, an excellent point and um, why I love the logo so much because that sort of sets the stage for that, for that principle and, um, and, and it's an incredibly inspiring story and inspiring logo. Well, I think um, there are a number of strategies for engaging youth. The um, conference has always had a youth program, so of course that's still going to be a key part. Um, we have a youth member on, on the CCC, a, um, a, a young man from West Africa. Um, we have a scholarship program that is in, that's entirely directed to to young people, which I would love to try and expand because that's at, not only do we want to engage them, but create leadership in, in that next generation. And I think social media is an area that um, I know the IS have invested um, heavily in. I mean, in addition to um, engaging a broader community through social media, there's also a, a investment in hubs uh, so that there will be access to um, to the information coming to, uh, from the conference but not for people that can't actually physically get to Melbourne. Um, so, you know, there are they're, they're the, they're some of the strategies but I agree with you, I think we um, see that as, as, a, as a top priority. Right, and then, and then maybe I can just remind Peter that UNAIDS is a very uh, integral part of the governance structure of the conference and so it's not your conference, but our conference. <laughs> yeah, so it's not only Sharon's responsibility, but we will all work towards this. Uh, first, I'll give Erasmus a chance, and then we'll take some questions from the countries, and then uh, more questions from the floor. Um, thank you very much, Professor, for a very good and free education. Normally, when education is this good, you pay a lot for it. So thank you. <laughs> I have two questions. One to do with the fact that if HIV cure is going to be a winning proposition, we have to speculate on cost for scaling up. It would be useful to hear some of your speculations on this, which is where for those of us, I work with the planning department of UNAIDS. That's where we would want to maybe get some insights from you. Second question relates to maybe the other side of cure, which is vaccine. I wonder what your relationship is and your research with people who also uh, consumed with the same question, but from a different angle, vaccine. Thank you. Yeah, um, the, the cost effectiveness question is a really important one. And I, um, I guess I alluded to that with um, the IAS setting up a working group to do exactly those sums. I mean, I, there's, been, there's been some modeling of what would make a cure cost effective? What would be the amount of money that you would need to spend balanced with 
toxicities from that intervention to ultimately make it cost effective. I have a very simplistic view of it. To me, if you can change lifelong treatment to five years of treatment, there has to be a saving in that. But it's more how, how costly the intervention is. And on the, on the few interventions I showed, um, gene therapy without a doubt will be, more, will be far more costly than a activating strategy. But we need to do a lot more work of, on it. I don't have the numbers around, but we have, IS have actually engaged the, the people that, that can do that modelling for us. And I think we'll hear more about it in the next, in the next few years. Um, the second question was around engagement with the vaccine world. Well, um, really actually quite critical. Um, I guess, first of all, I think to see the end of HIV, we need both. We, need, we have got really good biomedical stra pre prevention strategies. We know that treatment stops um, transmission, but you know the cheapest and most effective way to control any infectious diseases is with the vaccine. So I really do think we have to maintain investment in both vaccine and cure. The two, the two disciplines actually are coming together quite um, tightly now with this issue that I explained about um, whether we have to also activate and kill in, in, in getting rid of latency. And the kill side of it, um, many people are thinking would, would need a therapeutic type vaccine. Because what, when I was talking about activating latency, that makes the virus visible to the immune system. But if you've got a crappy immune system from having HIV infection for a long time, you may not ever have the cells to mop up the virus that's left over. So there's a lot of interest now in, in what's called shock and kill. Activate the virus and then come in and kill it. And one of those ways will be with a therapeutic vaccine. You know, therapeutic vaccines have been incredibly, incredibly tough to develop um, in the history of HIV. So I, I don't know how effective that intervention will be, but the, the science will be informative. Question from the field. Yes. Uh, uh, Michael is asking, is monitoring functional cure possible in developing countries, especially within the framework of the elimination agenda? Um, I think functional, functional cure, um, we have to always be thinking about um, developing countries, and I think that um, we need to do a lot more work to engage those countries in research, as well as um, making sure we have the tools to to. To, to, to measure the virus in, in low-income countries. So all of the work has been done in high-income countries around subtype B, and um, we need to have more um, engagement of low-income countries, something that I think the IS has prioritised as well. Will it be available? Well, that's, if, if, we, if we have something that's scalable and affordable, why not? And the, the last question I have, what are the epidemiological definitions of ending AIDS and HIV cure? And I, I know that the, we are still ourselves working on definitions of uh, the end of AIDS, but uh, maybe you could give your thoughts to the definition of the HIV cure and the end of AIDS. Yeah, um, I've thought about this quite a bit. Um, for me, end of AIDS is stopping people becoming sick from HIV, and that's what treatment will do effectively. Um, we know we have the tools, we have the drugs that will stop people having disease progression or, or developing, uh, developing AIDS, and I think that is achievable with treatment. Um, ending HIV, um, if we stop every new infection tomorrow, we have 33 million people who have HIV who are going to be on lifelong treatment, and that's going to need a sterilising or functional cure. That's how I think of it. So I think ending, ending AIDS... Um, I think is a different message to ending HIV. Um, I'd love to move the agenda to ending HIV, but I think ending AIDS is, is, a, is an achievable goal through treatment. Yeah, thanks, Oli, and uh, thank you again, Sharon. I think Michelle said you all uh, bring you here. I, for Erasmus and the others, if you like the lecture, I saw the laboratories of Cheryl operating, and what she has done in Melbourne is one of the most impressive uh, sites to visit, not because of the research per se, but because of the relevance, what she's doing there, that may impact on the lives of people tomorrow. 
in terms of, and I saw that it happened with Air Team, with how passionate, how moving, it's really a great experience. The challenge is back to Cheryl, you know, how she can continue to do that uh, with the <laughs> intense that I saw there and the handle the conference. But that's something that we are talking about <laughs> and to help, trying to help her as much as we can. We have several uh, tracks, let's see, roadmaps open today that you take us all the way to the conference, the issues that Michelle have uh, 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 actually uh, triggered before and initiate. One of them, as said, is the discussion end of AIDS. We are convening a, a think tank in the next few weeks and uh, on that, and we will see that if we continue to work, but I think it's reasonable to think that's a work that you take as easily. Melbourne is tomorrow, yeah, in practical terms, it's very soon. Uh, we have a, a track that's associated to you that Peter Fawcett was briefing us in terms of the Mississippi babe and the, the implications, including in terms of pediatric treatment, as we know very well. Children are one of the groups that are excluded from treatment today at large compared to adults. We have a public health interest on that as well. We have a track open in terms of, that also initiated by Michelle in moving change the narrative of the epidemic. Is the hotspot stories that you know, that is a project taking us forward. I'm, I am convinced that you, you, that you change the way that we are seeing the AIDS epidemic. And the narrative will change is another track that I think is taking us all the way to Melbourne. And of course, as midnight you are saying, as you are here, we are, as you are speaking, you are initiating another one that we are very uh, keen to, to push forward with a lot of hope on this. It's the first time in the history of UNAIDS that we have a meeting in the headquarters like that Fox specific on LGBT and gay men in 30 years of epidemic. And that's a way to bring also this issue back to the center, the vulnerable populations, and again, you match one of your main objectives in the conference. I mean, we, as Michelle said, we are not only supporting you on what we can in terms of organizing the conference. We count you as friends like Bill Botel, that's an old friend of UNH, to help us to find the right way to Australia. He knows well the country, <laughs> the place. But in addition to that, also, I think we have some thematic tracks yeah. that would be good to coordinate further uh, with you. I yeah. don't have a question, but just to, again, follow the line uh, that Michelle introduced. It's wonderful to have you here, and it's great to know, as I know, what you are doing back in Australia as well. Thank you, Lewis. And I, I, I'm convinced, um, Lewis has told me I need to give up my day job for the next 14 months. I'm telling him I don't want to give up my day job. He says, you have to. You can't do the conference with full time. But anyway, um, you know, and I think the more we talk, um, the the synergies and the way we think is, um, come, you know, the more Lewis um, and his team were in, in Melbourne just three weeks ago, and, I, and that really generated a lot of, um, or crystallised a lot of my thinking around the conference through those discussions, and I think many of the conference members. So you're right, face-to-face -face engagement, talking makes makes a big difference. So we, we need to do lots more of that. If you want to go to Africa, we do. You want to have the pipeline? She invited you today. You want to go to Africa? Yes. We use you to a few countries. Situational. To see if, yes. if <laughs> we do the face-to-face, -face and okay. we can prepare okay. a calendar. Okay. <laughs> We have time for a few more questions. Yes. Um, yes, one here, David. Please state your name. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that uh, great uh, presentation. Uh, my name is uh, David uh, Chipanta. Uh, I am uh, one of the, uh, the people that is uh, living with uh, HIV. And uh, when I heard you talk about uh, treatment interruption, I think uh, I was very much encouraged. I think uh, many of us, uh, you know, we are on treatment for a long time. For I've been living with HIV for over 20 years. I think there are others uh, even longer and are taking treatment uh, for over 15 years. Um, but the problem is um, uh, I'm probably uh, uh, unique, you know, because I think I, I take treatment every day. But I think most of my colleagues, uh, they're saying, look, 
I can't take this for, for the rest of my life. So I'm just um, uh, checking with you. I think if there were some, at least an end point, to say that if you have uh, taken treatment up to a certain time or if your biological uh, markers are doing uh, well, maybe uh, you should um, uh, stop. Uh, because I think that would be really encouraging for uh, a lot of people. So just checking uh, from you if there is research in, uh, you know, long-term, you know, effective um, uh, treatment interruption uh, candidates. Yeah, I think um, several years ago we learned that treatment interruption from a very large definitive study, which was called SMART, told us that treatment interruption was not good. It's not good for people... Um, because the burst of virus that happens in most people leads to inflammation and leads to adverse events. So I think I'm pretty um, comfortable as a scientist and a clinician that that question's been answered, that treatment interruption um, is not good. But I think what you articulate is a really important point, that um, we, people can say, well, treatments are great, just need to take one tablet a day and, you know, you're right. Well, actually, it's actually quite tough for people to, I mean, we're, we're talking about paying for treatment, but even just the experience of lifelong treatment is, is really a big deal and a big issue for many people. Unfortunately, just stopping treatment we know doesn't work. We're, that's been answered. But now what we're thinking is if we can, why does the virus just come shooting back up as soon as you stop it? If we can reduce the amount of virus that's in people on treatment by tackling these reservoirs, maybe we can get it down to a critically low level that when you stop, the virus doesn't come shooting back up like what happened with the Visconti patients. They were patients that did stop, but it seemed for some, they were able to get their virus to very low levels. So that's, that's the, the challenge. And the ultimate goal for a functional cure is for people to safely stop treatment. I think at the moment we know it's not safe to stop treatment, unfortunately, but that's, that's really the long-term goal of that work. Get rid of the amount of virus that's sitting in people on treatment to a critically low level that they can safely stop. Right, I think we have uh, time for one more question from Gentine. Andrea, you had a question as well? Okay, please make it short. Yeah, Thank short. you. Yeah, thanks so much for the presentation. Really uh, inspiring and hopeful, so thanks so much. Uh, my name is Jantine Jacobi. I'm heading the team on gender equality and diversity. And I was wondering, do you anticipate a difference, a sex difference, and in particular for women of reproductive age? Um... So far, women have been underrepresented in all of the clinical trials, and that's because of where the trials are being done in Melbourne, in San Francisco, in Denmark, which are predominantly um, where the epidemic is in men or sex with men. So unfortunately, I can't answer that. But um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very important issue. Women of reproductive age not on a um, hormonal contraceptive are excluded from the studies because the interventions we're using do have toxicities but I think it will need to, it does and will be a, a priority to make sure there's equal enrolment but I'm I um, unfortunately the studies today have really all been in men um, theoretically would there be a difference I, I don't anticipate there would be but we need to know the answer to that Thanks, Sharon, for your excellent presentation. I'm still thinking about the headline of the Telegraph, a cure within month. Well, we all know how long it takes to do research. We all know how long it takes to do clinical trials afterwards, if you find new drugs, if you mm. find a cure. And you said we don't want these kind of headlines. We will have a cure very soon, end to AIDS, etc. How optimistic, because you want investment, how optimistic are you that it will take years to get to a cure, that investment will come. You alluded to the IES uh, group with the industry, and we all know there are lots of issues around this, patent protection, etc. but we need millions and millions, if not billions, of investment to find a cure. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's um, public awareness is key to pushing, I'm speaking to the expert here, <laughs> in being able to manage the message, but that... I think, um, and UNA does that really well, and I think we have to become a lot more sophisticated in how we manage that message. So it has to be um, seen by the public as, um, they have to understand 
the complexity, they have to understand why it's a priority, um, but we have to find a way that we don't have headlines like that because they 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 really they really are very damaging. Um, com um, of course, you don't funding science doesn't all just come from what, what's in the public arena, but I think also the IAS has been very um, uh, effective in um, developing a clear strategy and articulating the message clearly. And part of that is around um, refining the arguments for cost effectiveness, which is an area that that we're working on. Um, managing the media, you're the expert. Michelle should give us some advice. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, this uh, was a great, uh, a great presentation followed by uh, a series of good questions. My question uh, is a very short one and very simple. Functional cure, five years, ten years? <laughs> I'm not answering that. <laughs> you see? So, uh, uh, for me, what we need to do is to continue to really uh, advocate for... Uh, functional cure for cure. We need to continue to uh, create space uh, for uh, research and uh, development of a new uh, treatment uh, regimen, which will also, in between, help uh, millions of people to be easily on treatment. Because for me, if I follow properly your presentation, that is key. It is not uh, uh, contradictory. Uh, it is uh, two sides of the same coin, and we need to work on those. And I want to just uh, also let you know that uh, Melbourne conference will be completely different. I believe that uh, it will come in the region where we have uh, a different type of uh, epidemic, but at the same time, it will certainly come in the period where, uh, when the world will uh, start thinking about uh, certainly dealing with uh, disease in different way. So Melbourne will uh, be important because it will push us to reflect on the place of uh, HIV AIDS in uh, the future and uh, how we'll deal with uh, uh, epidemic like HIV and how we'll really be creative enough, and like I was saying during the lunch, uh, to spare aid a new debate which will uh, engage uh, different partners and uh, partners who will be able to learn from our experience to move uh, uh, certainly towards more sustainable health for people. And that uh, we cannot avoid this debate. We need to prepare ourselves and we need to be able to uh, certainly start already uh, addressing those uh, issues and make them part of our agenda in Melbourne. So to not wait people to almost uh, impose to us their own agenda, but being the one who will uh, anticipate and uh, certainly help uh, to uh, create new space for uh, dealing with this uh, epidemic and we, are, we know that even if I am calling for 000, uh, it will be with us uh, for a long time to come. And, uh, but uh, the way we have been able to address it uh, in the last 30 years, I'm not convinced that we will have the same uh, opportunity, the same resource base, the same uh, synergies. So we need to be able to create a new space, but uh, this new space will start with uh, people like you, uh, people who will be bringing hope, people who will be helping us to redefine what means uh, ending AIDS, people who will be able also to convince uh, the, the politician in different way that uh, we are not just in for uh, the rest of our life, that we will uh, not be able to bring an uh, innovative way to deal with this uh, uh, epidemic, I think that uh, will also help us to uh, move forward. And uh, thanks again uh, for uh, taking time to come. Uh, thanks for people who have been uh, listening. And like I was saying, uh, you know, we need more and more of people like you. And uh, thanks, Louise, for creating this uh, space. I think it's very important 
Thanks, uh, Bertrand, and your team to be with us. And uh, I would like just to say that uh, the greatest thing we learn from HIV is that when you are alone, you are losing. When we are together, uh, we are uh, at least making progress. And uh, this partnership, I will uh, strengthen it between science, uh, social change groups, uh, people uh, living with HIV. It's critical for us to not lose their voice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you are wonderful. You have to come in Durban. Eh? You have to come to Peter. Yeah. Yes, Mali will just come. <laughs> Yes, don't go to every single no, place. No, actually, Louis said we should okay. do three yes. of us.